That was the defendant, John Valero, on the stand last night in what's called an allocution. He was speaking to the jury, not under oath, not being asked questions by his own attorney, not subject to cross-examination. In essence, it was a speech meant to save his own life because this jury has a choice, whether to send him back to death row or whether he deserves life behind bars with parole or without parole. Alan Turkheimer is a jury consultant in Chicago who's been with us on the Law News Network many times. And Alan, you have a special window into the way juries think about these. So we wanted to ask you uh, initially your reaction to that speech by the defense. I thought he gave a pretty effective speech. A lot of it is going to come down to how authentic the jurors are going to think he was. But his goal was to create separation between how old he was and who he was at the time this murder occurred back in 1986 and who he is now. He emphasized that he was 21 years old. He talked about being in prison for 31 years. And he said he was a mess back then. So he was contrite. And he's trying to convey to the jury that that was then, this is now, and appeal to jurors who are going to think, okay, he was, he's been in prison for so long, he's served enough punishment, why are we going to add to it and take his life, which is a really big next step for jurors to take. Yeah, I mean, th this opens up a really bizarre legal window in that basically this guy could save his own life by getting a bunch of stuff into the record and in front of this jury to um, say that he's reformed himself after having been sent to death row. Well, the prosecutor did point out on some of the cross-examinations, well, you know, you're housed by yourself. You don't have a lot of contact with other people. Uh, of course, you're not grating with anyone or, you know, a braiding on anyone to cause conflict behind bars because you're just not around enough people to do it. But I mean, you know, if, if this is the way this is going to go, and I understand the reason it happened because the original conviction was overturned, but talk about a bizarre circumstance. I mean, heck, why don't we just let every death row inmate have another trial and let a jury determine whether or not they've reformed themselves after the fact? Right, because of a quirk in the instructions that was deemed vague, and jurors all, all over the country all the time are asked to deal with definitions and concepts, and depravity of mind is, a, is what was uh, taken issue with, with the judge, and so he's, he's pretty lucky in the sense that he gets another bite at the apple to get in front of the jury and essentially give, his, give a monologue, his own statement, without any cross-examination, and like you alluded to, all these factors that he gets to put in in front of the jury that won't necessarily comport with the reality of being in solitary with minimal interaction with anybody for such a long time. Well, you do all the research into the way juries react to this. So uh, part of me wonders if this is a counting game because all he needs to do is get one juror to agree that he shouldn't be sent back to death row, and then this falls apart. Now, in theory, the prosecutor could re retry this death penalty hearing if the jury hangs, or they could just turn around and say, okay, well, because the jury hung, it's life behind bars. You know, so let's talk about different types of jurors who might look at it one way and look at it the other way. If there are jurors on that jury that want to send them back to death row, can, can you give us a sense of who they might be and how they're thinking? Sure. I think they might pick on the fact that this is unusual and that they don't want to mess with what's already happened. So they might, they're going to be probably a little more skeptical and they're going to look at that statement and think, well, this was prepared by his lawyer. This is something he has to do. And they have the mindset that, yeah, he's contrite now and he's on Mrs. Blackwell, but what if he wasn't caught or what if he had this opportunity? Would he really be thinking about Mrs. Blackwell every day? of his life. So there are going to be some jurors on there who are going to evaluate him, uh, take, take what he says with a grain of salt. And like you said, it really benefits the past time and the fact that he just has to reach out to one, one juror. And so 11 people say, yes, let's uh, reinstate the sentence him to the death penalty and recommend that while you see them to say, no, I'm not there. So what about the type of juror who might look and say, you know, I believe that this shouldn't be a death penalty case. He got up there 
I believe him. I believe the other witnesses who said that he's reformed himself. Um, can you take us inside that juror's mind? Sure. And, you know, it's, you've heard of death qualified juries, and everybody has to say that they would consider it. But there are a lot of steps in between saying I could consider sentencing someone to death and then actually doing it while they're essentially looking at a defendant in the eye and having control over that person's life. So there are some jurors that, sure, they might say that they could consider the death penalty, but when it comes down to it, there are certain humanitarian factors that are at the forefront in their decision-making that would make it really difficult to say, yes, this is a death sentence case and he should be given the death penalty. So it's, it'll be an interesting deliberation, and I'm sure you'll hear a whole range of jurors will hear and articulate a range of different viewpoints. And in the end, it's just going to come down to who are the, the leaders, who's going to be more vociferous, who's going to give. But I certainly do think that his allocution statement is going to be pivotal in the way they assess what verdict they determine. Uh, what plays into the way the jurors might sit on this case on one side of the fence or on the other? Is it education? Is it life experience? Uh, is it a mix of everything? I think it's a mix. There were certain factors that the case involved. Uh, knew about who the victim was. She was a prostitute. And some might think, well, do I, how, how do I evaluate that? Uh, there were the multiple stabbings. There was all the physical evidence. So I don't think it's going to come down to demographics. I'm not sure any uh, juror is going to identify with him necessarily uh, or the victim in this case. So I think it just depends on how people view that penalty. If people are a little more tolerant of malfeasance and whether they're, they're more forgiveness or they're more able to forgive or not. People have a certain tendency to forgive under certain circumstances. Others say no chance However, if somebody does something, and probably someone more authoritarian minded, somebody does something, and this is the ultimate penalty the prosecution is asking for, I think that's what I'm going to vote for. There's a range of attitudes at play, and it's that's an how they determine whether or not they see that. Uh, Alan, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if the connection is getting a little bit spotty here, but I, I wanted to ask, and perhaps we asked you this question earlier on in this case, but uh, because it's a death penalty trial, if you were the defendant's uh, attorney or you were consulting for the defendant's attorney, what sort of person would you want to get on that jury? I'd want someone who was a little more warm-hearted, uh, so to speak, and someone who would err on the side of caution, because obviously the death penalty is irreversible. So I'd want someone that would give someone, even like Mr. Valerio, the benefit of the doubt if it's a question of life versus death somebody who would nuance in, in the scenario and who's also willing to understand rehabilitation and somebody who thinks that will get better with the passage of time and somebody who wants to believe in the goodness of individuals, even if it's somebody who's been convicted of murder. Now, uh, as, it, as it comes uh, to the evidence that's been presented, one interesting thing that uh, wound up in front of the jury is this uh, religious uh, person, uh, this uh, minister in the UCC church. She is uh, at home in the Berkshires in western Massachusetts, and she is uh, apparently wrote to this defendant, befriended him, has gone to visit him, talks to him on the phone, what name, you know, Add it all together, she considers him a friend now. And she testified in this case. And I thought it was, it was interesting to have that kind of a witness on the stand who is in front of this jury, having only known the defendant after the original conviction. So how did juries take that? You know, the whole notion that uh, there's someone uh, with a, a religious dogma, religious beliefs getting up there and saying, oh, well, uh, this is the sort of work that I do. Uh, and, you know, getting getting that in front of the jury, just it, it's something that I, I, I can't say that I've seen before. Uh, I know there's a rule of evidence that you know, having a religious belief does not make you more or less truthful or accurate or believable. Uh, but the bottom line is she testified and uh, the rules of evidence don't apply in these sort of hearings in, uh, in New Mexico beyond the mere test for relevance. 
and uh, anything, almost anything is relevant in a case like this. It'll nudge the jury's perception one way or the next. So that makes it relevant. How does the jury walk away with that, though? Um, you know, it's just another piece of evidence, a piece of testimony. I can't say I've seen anything similar to in the past. Right. It's very unusual. And the jury knows that there's a finite number of witnesses that have come into contact with Valeria over the last several decades. They'll, they'll evaluate it, they'll accept it, but they, they understand that it's unusual. And I, people know that there are certain individuals out there, whether they're seeking fame or whether they have some kind of quirk in their personality, whether they're attracted to people in prison, whatever it is, this is somewhat known at the general population. So I think when somebody, a friend, Lario, and testify, I think some of the jurors are going to be skeptical of what this person has to say. They're not going to, they're not going to take her word and automatically determine that well, she should be telling the truth. They understand context is important, and jurors are very good at using context to evaluate testimony. So it, it's not as if somebody we knew this person throughout his whole life and it has been with him during every single interaction he had with every single person. No, this is just somebody who, even before meeting him, had some affinity for him, wanted to reach out to him, and wanted to interact with him in a way. And you know, the, the conclusion is that, sure, someone like that who's going to testify is most likely going to say something good about uh, the defendant. Otherwise, it wouldn't testify. But I, I don't think that witness is going to have that much credibility. I think they're going to spend a lot more time discussing his actual allocution when deciding what decision they're going to render. Uh, if you uh, had a sense of where this thing was going, do you think that that testimony, or I shouldn't say testimony, that elocution, it wasn't testimony, uh, do you think it's enough to save his life? I, I tend to think it does uh, save his life. Uh, a lot of it is just because he didn't, I don't think he hurt himself by what he said. I don't think he came off as, as reading a script. I don't think he came off as insincere. And I think he did remind the jury that that was then, this is now. And that's that's what he had to do. And especially looking at the numbers, if he makes that argument and resonates with one person, then he's going to for his life. Up to that point, things didn't look so good for him. It was a prosecution put on a good case. And certainly the jurors came in with being that penalty qualified. So it's not like you have somebody from the population out there that just showed up who might be adamantly against the death penalty. So I think he did himself a favor. I think he came off as sincere and just reminded the jury that, okay, here I am now. It happened so long ago. Give me the benefit of the doubt. Closing arguments from the prosecution and defense. Where do you think each side needs to go? Prosecutors have to take jurors back to 1986, and they have to say, look, this is what happened. This is how... A woman, Mrs. Blackwell, was bludgeoned to death. She was how she was murdered, and they don't want to go too far with that because the jury knows that she was murdered. They heard all the evidence, they heard witnesses, but they have to get the jurors in a psychological mindset that emanates from 1986. And defense, they have to take the, the opposite tack and say, "Look, he's, he's talking about how he's remorseful. He thinks about her. He's changed. He Listen to his testimony. He, he admits that he was a mess back then." And he's not changing just because he wants to spare his life. He's not changing because he wants to get in front of the parole committee in the future. He really changed because that's the right thing to do. He's down on his hands and knees like he alluded to in elocution, and he's pleading for mercy. You know, uh, I, I think I agree with you. Uh, you know, they've got a, the prosecution that I, is, I should say, needs to take the jury back to 1986 and really go into the nitty gritty of what happened here. You've got a victim with 45 stab wounds and then additional blunt force trauma wounds. And the prosecution needs to make it really clear why this is a death penalty eligible case, because not all murders are. And the element that they're trying to use to get into that is this element of mutilation. Now, I don't know about you, Alan, but I can't say that I've ever heard of a crime where there are five areas on the victim's body, okay, including each of the two breasts, that each have eight stab wounds. That sounds like something calculated and where a specific number of wounds were delivered in specific places for specific reasons. 
not just a crime of passion, uh, not even just a premeditated crime. It sounds like basically what the prosecution is alleging, and that's some kind of mutilation or some kind of torture. Well, those are two of the big elements that the prosecution needs to hit at in order to ratchet this case up to the level of being a death penalty case. I'm wondering if that kind of argument's really going to resonate with this jury, because at the end of the day, the evidence is the evidence, and they've got the pictures that, that they've been looking at that we haven't been showing because uh, the poor victim's body was uh, highly decomposed by the, po the point it was found. But the defense can't take that fact away. Right, right. They can't change the instruction. And jurors usually, well, they always do their best and they try to follow the instructions. And it's hard to disentangle what happened from the notion of mutilation or torture. That is, like you say, that's, that's really an aberration from the type of murders that are, the jurors have to assess. This is very unusual. And they're going to look at the, the instructions after closings, and then they have to decide, well, we follow the law, this is this is it, but kind of, uh, as you were saying earlier, they're going to do their best to look at the law, and they're going to read it and interpret it and try to apply the facts, but you might have one or two jurors that are saying, well, but still, the bottom line is it was murder, and I don't feel like this person should be put to death for it. Yeah, it was gruesome, it was horrific, but I just have a slight reservation. Maybe some people might think we'll suffer more alive in prison for the rest of his life. I've heard that argument put forward by some jurors in these cases. Yeah, now, Alan, I'll ask you just one or two more questions here before we wrap up for the day, but part of me wonders if this is the sort of case that we've talked about a few times before where uh, there's a, a juror with a very strong belief that this should be a death penalty case, and if they're the sort of juror who uh, tends to have a more forceful personality. Uh, that jury, that juror could have a sway over the rest of the jury. My guess is if you were consulting with the prosecution, you'd be looking for that juror and trying to make sure that that juror stays on the case. Right. And it's going to come down to personality. And I think it's, it's more likely that somebody in deliberations, if somebody believes in guilt, it's more likely they'll flip to not guilty versus the other way around. And in this case, it's actually similar. That it would, which helps the defendant Valerio. It's more likely somebody who argues for the death penalty decides life without parole versus the other way around, somebody saying, okay, we'll just go with the death penalty. But absolutely, it comes down to personality and persuasion. If somebody has a strong belief in the death penalty, at least as a prosecution season for this case, they're going to want to empower that juror uh, in their closing arguments and deliberations. Be armed with plenty of ammunition to argue their case in deliberations. Well, we are getting close to the end of the broadcast day here. So Alan Turkheimer, jury consultant out of Chicago. Good to see you back here on Law News. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Uh, Alan's